Hey, I've been getting a lot of questions um, from emails and comments and various videos and things like that. People want me to answer questions and I don't really have a format to do that in the videos that I do. So, um, got a new solution. So stick with us. I'm Flywire. Hey, I'm Scott Purdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to do Q&A. We're going to do a mailbag. Um, I didn't really, couldn't really think about any other format for answering a bunch of questions and stuff like that uh, with y'all out there. So, because it didn't really fit into the videos, I do it on a subject. I don't, I don't uh, like making videos about myself so much. Um, it's not really about me. But a lot of people are interested in stuff, so I'm going to do this uh, Q&A. And, it's uh, I, I I lifted it from somebody else on the on the YouTube universe. Uh, you know what they say: plagiarism is basic to all culture, and uh, or maybe it's the highest form of flattery. I don't know. But here we go. So the first question of the day is from Mike Purcell, Purcell. Uh, in the 3M leading edge tape segment, I see a wedge-shaped object extending from the leading edge of the right wing. What is that? What purpose does it serve? Um, after I typed this out, I started thinking it might be something to do with your aerobatics that you do with Charlie, like to play some mounted camera or something. Well, you almost got it right. It is a. It does have to do with aerobatics. Actually, it is a uh, uh, vortex generator. It's a giant vortex generator. People who uh, have an irreverent sense of humor or whatever, they call it the uh, check writing shelf, and uh, you can find it on later model A36s. And uh, when that came out, um, somewhere along in there, there was a service bulletin that uh, you had to comply with if you wanted to keep your E33C and your F33C in the aerobatic category. And it made a number of changes, and one of those changes was adding one of these uh, vortex generators uh, on front of the wing so it would create uh, airflow over the aileron. So that's what it's for, and you have to have it to be in the aerobatic category. They don't make those kits anymore, and there are some folks out there that have, I know one guy has an F33C, they didn't do it, and now they're regretting it. So what can you say? That's what it's for, and I'm going to put a picture on. Hopefully you just saw that picture and uh, see what it looks like. Not from out in the camera. Don't do that. Uh, Monty... Uh, Manasco uh, asked me, he said, uh, when I was in high school, we used to go out to Clovis and watch F-111s fly around. That is a cool, huge looking jet. I heard you flew F-4s and then F-15s. What was, was that because the F-4s were being phased out? A lot of people ask me about my background and uh, uh, the different things I've done. So I'll give you short and quick and dirty. Again, it's not really about me. There's a thousand other guys that have had the kind of career I've had. So. Uh, it's uh, I enjoy it and I'm happy and I wish I, I wouldn't mind doing it again uh, older and wiser maybe <laughs> I miss the jet every day but uh, whatever so anyway I started out in the Marines when I graduated high school uh, I went right in, actually I graduated high school early and then I went to Marine Corps all told I spent about eight years in the Marines I got out and uh, uh, finished college. Uh, I'd worked on a little bit when I was in the Marine Corps and then uh, finished college and I went through the PLC program in the Marine Corps because I wanted to fly and I had a pilot slot for a while and then uh, this is in the early 80s they took away seemed a whole bunch of people's pilot slots. I wasn't just the only one but they did a lot of guys so um, I punched. You know I didn't want to be a grunt anymore. I tried that once so uh, I went into the Air Force and uh, then I got to got to fly there, and I did fly F-4s, um, and I had a good time doing that. Um, and then I got to, I went and spent a uh, tour as an ALO. That's what I did during the first Gulf War. I was an ALO on the ground with the 9th Syrian Armored Division, which was uh, kind of unusual. But uh, there I was, me and my Romad, <laughs> out, out in the desert. It was, uh, there's some interesting stories there. But uh, from that, I got to fly uh, the F-15A Strike Eagle, both in, uh, I flew in, uh, went to training in Luke, and then uh, was stationed at RAF Lakenheath, 
and then I came back to Seymour Johnson and I was in the FTU teaching new guys how to fly the F-15 and uh, that's where I retired from. So that's my career, quick and dirty. I went into the airlines after that. Alexander Ekman says, uh, or asked, he says, I'm looking for a straight tail Cessna 182 to buy a very good pedigree, big engine installed for around 110K. Are you aware of anything for sale in it off market? Something already in the stall kit and backcountry gear would work well for me. Well, I think if you're looking for something stall kit with backcountry gear and all that stuff with a big engine, you're probably looking pretty much north of 110. But uh, no, I, I don't keep track of the market and uh, I don't. Um, if I'm interested in something and I look at that, it's just it's so volatile and uh, uh, some people would say I buy and sell airplanes fairly often. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that may be true, but uh, no, I, I just don't keep track of the market. Sorry. Uh, Jerry Miller, he says, uh, my, now my name is Jerry, I live in the DFW area, and I'm 54 years old, and I would like to know, am I too old to start working on airplanes? If I am not, who and where should I go to learn how to work on them? Of course you're not too old, you know, not, and as long as you can lift a wrench and study and uh, you can you can work, of course you can follow your dream, that's what I'd say. So probably the best thing to do, well there's a couple options, one is is you can go get a job as an apprentice uh, with a maintenance shop and uh, then you can do the hard way, that's how I did, I got my AMP and then later my IA, is uh, I worked on airplanes under supervision and it takes three years to do that to get qualified then you got to take all your tests and stuff like that um, so there's that or you can go and spend two years at the uh, Tarrant County Community College TCC has a really excellent A&P program uh, I'm not sure about uh, Dallas I, I believe there was uh, an A&P program but I really don't know much about it but uh, I know the the one in Fort Worth, TCC, is really good. I've actually been there and uh, see how they do stuff. So I think that that's a great option. You should try that out. And if you just want to volunteer, there's the CAF uh, at uh, Redbird. Go volunteer and you can kind of get an idea and a taste. Is this what I really would like to do? So you can, it's kind of a low cost way and, and you get some good camaraderie out of that. So check that out. Uh, <clears throat> Dick Henderson says, hi again, I bet on the B-17 turbochargers, the turbochargers are never used if installed, hooked up and running. I know the EA B-17, they're not. Normally the turbocharger wastegates, he's talking about the 909 here, and uh, I think probably with my uh, video with Juan Brown as a follow-up on the 909 accident, normally the turbocharger wastegates are opened on all these privately owned turbocharged aircraft if the turbos are installed and operational. Uh, now the B-17 aside, the right 1820-97 manifold pressure at takeoff power with 115-145 fuel is around 54 inches, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think you're right. I haven't really looked at it in a while, uh, but um, nobody does that anymore. You can't get 115-145, um, so Nobody does that. And actually during the war they had uh, various grades of fuel that you could use and there was a uh, instruction that you could say, okay, I fly this engine and I have this fuel, then it tells you what manifold pressure and RPM that you're allowed to use with that fuel so you don't detonate. So pretty much uh, for the 1820, uh, around 44 inches is what people use with 100 low lead for takeoff. Okay. Now the now the a days the hundred low lead fuel takeoff manifold pressure is on forty eight. I don't know there may be. I don't know anybody using forty eight inches. That's pretty high. Uh, now I don't know diddly about the operation of the seventeen, so give me a little slack. Sure, absolutely. But like I originally said, the power check is to see all if all cylinders are operating normally. Of course, the mag check is performed at the same time. Prop checks are accomplished at a much lower RPM, fifteen hundred to sixteen hundred. Uh, there is some variation when prop checks are done. Um, in general, they're about 1700 RPM. 
and he's, he is referring to my video with Juan Brown here. He says that two minutes and 33 seconds into the video, you stated that power check is at field barometric pressure is to see is the, if the engine is producing takeoff power in caps. Takeoff power would be at a much higher manifold pressure. Uh, anyway, I could go on, but I know what you said was meant to try to explain things. Uh, okay, well, it may be just a, I may have, I don't think I misspoke here. It is done, the power check is done at field bar barometric pressure. And that's how you measure whether or not you're going to produce takeoff power. So that's correct. What you're actually looking for is a target RPM. Uh, for instance, in the uh, uh, R2600, like the B25 has, as I remember, it's uh, uh, field bar barometric pressure and you're looking for 2200 RPM plus or minus 50. And I flew DC3 with the 1820s on it, and as I remember, the RPM was about the same, 2200 plus or minus 50. So that's how you tell if you're going to have, have takeoff power. And uh, that's why it's called a power check. And of course, the cylinders are operating, and if they're not, well, then you find that out. Uh, the mag checks uh, are done at a lower manifold pressure and RPM. All right. Mike McDaniel, future video subject. Uh, oh, here we go. I thought an interesting video would be about your military career, specifically flying the F 4 versus the F 15. It'd be great for us non-military guys. Uh, we know when I was growing up the, uh, in the Air Force, people would say that you always love your first fighter. Uh, that's your favorite, no matter what you fly later on. And I'm here to tell you that uh, I, it's not quite true. I think I loved flying the F-4. I thought it was great. Uh, the F-4 was had a lot of weird idiosyncrasies. It was great to actually fly it. Um, you know, when you, you couldn't check six in that airplane in the front seat. <laughs> That's why he needed a backseater, because he could see behind you, but you can't see it from the front. Um, the most you could see, if I, if I strain really hard, you know, it has uh, anhedral. The wingtips actually stick up uh, instead of, you can kind of see it on that F4 over my shoulder right here. The, the wingtips kind of stick up a little bit, and uh, I could barely see that if I worked really hard out of the cockpit looking back. Uh, so that's not good. You know, if you're doing an air-to-air -air fight, uh, you don't see the guy if he's somewhere in your six. You know, if you if you can kick him out a little bit higher, then you might be able to see him over the top of the canopy. But uh, and here's another example. Another thing I didn't like about it was um, back in those days, they didn't believe in air conditioning, uh, temperature control for the people. They used it to cool the equipment. So by the time it got to you, it was uh, it, it wasn't stellar. Uh, I remember uh, after a red flag landing at Nellis in the uh, middle of the afternoon, middle of July. You know, it's 110, 115 outside, something like that. At the end of the runway, popping the canopy and going, oh, that feels cool. <laughs> uh, I did like flying the F-4. It was, uh, it was an interesting airplane. But the F-15, man, I mean, you could turn around and look behind you you could check six and they fixed everything that was wrong with the F4 and uh, the F15 was just a an absolutely wonderful airplane to fly and, and people would always give us a lot of razz about uh, you know big how big it was people call it the flying tennis court well okay great flying tennis court I got a great big radar you know and uh, uh, I can reach out and touch you of course and I flew we had uh, AMRAMs and you know, other uh, nice AIM-9s, you know, AIM-120s and AIM-9s. Uh, they've even got better stuff now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a great airplane. We didn't have Link-16, uh, but um, I fought Link-16 guys, and there's a couple of tactics that uh, works well against those guys. So, people, when I retired, people would ask me, um, did I miss the Air Force? And they find out that I've been, I retired from the Air Force. Do I miss it? I go, well, you know, I, I don't miss the Air Force for a minute, but I miss the jet every day, you know, and that's still true. I still do. Okay. Bob Crystal says, uh, Scott, I sat down with a student today and watched the video on the engine out and returned to the airport. The impossible turn. I actually did a couple of videos on that. Uh, 
And here's a suggestion that I add to my briefing. In order to emphasize minimum turnaround altitude, I have the students say passing through minimum safe altitude, which I teach is 1,000 to 1,500. Otherwise, line straight ahead below safe engine out altitude. It's not a bad number. You know, have a number, have a concept, and uh, see what works for you. Especially the heavier wing loaded airplanes, it's going to be a higher altitude. I mean, a Cub or a Super Cub or something like that is so lightly wing loaded, you can turn around. The Stearman can turn around. I can, I can do it in 500 feet if I had an engine failure and a Stearman, maybe less, but not in a Bonanza. No. Too heavily wing loaded. He says this is this eliminates the temptation to turn around and uh, the possible stall spin. Absolutely. Please clarify bank angle of 45 degrees in the turn and the speed, please. Um, so, what's going on here with the 45 degree turn is uh, that's about the best turn you can do, um, and still, you know, it doesn't take an awful lot of thought and time to keep from stalling the airplane, okay? Um, speed, what I want to fly in this situation is not best glide speed. You see my videos on men sink, uh, best glide men sink. Uh, what I want to fly here is, is men sink. And, and that's not a number you're going to find in the POH. Um, why I like men sink is uh, it is optimized for spending as much time in the air as you can versus going as far as you can. Best glide is to go as far as you can. And, uh, well, I'm not going anywhere. I want to stay in the air long enough to complete the turnaround and land where I came from. So I'm not very far from uh, the airfield. So that's why I fly men sink. Uh, why I fly it at 45 degrees is because, you know, you're right on the ragged edge of the stall at, uh, at men sink speed. And, and frankly, in the Bonanza, men sink for the airplane I was, I did the test in it was about 76 knots, but Beach has a uh, uh, emergency speed, emergency approach speed of 81 knots. And that turns out to be pretty close to that uh, DMMS concept. Um, and 81 knots gives you enough energy to flare when you reach the ground. And men sink doesn't. So, you know, you have to try these things out in the air and see what works for you and your airplane and how you, at your typical loadings, and then uh, see what works for you. But 45 degrees is the best turn you can make. And that's what you're looking for is you, you need to turn it around if you're going to turn it around. If not, have the criteria, and I talked in the video what criteria I usually teach, but 1,000 to 1,500 feet land straight ahead, you know, that's safe. So do that. It's good stuff. Uh, Greg Man Mason says, Hi Scott, love the work you do, very educational, inspirational. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on buying a 1955 F-35 V-tail. I love the looks and the performance, and I think it would fit my needs. However, I've been told by the only mechanic I know to stay far, far away from them for reasons from magnesium parts to fluttering midair, which could cause the airplane to break up and other things. Uh, well, I've had three uh, V-tails. Let's see, a P, a J-35, and then a V-35B. And they're fantastic airplanes. And as all airplanes are, every airplane has idiosyncrasies. And one of those uh, these issues with the V-tail is, yeah, they are made, the rudder rotors are made out of magnesium. And uh, they don't have, uh, uh, there's no replacement skins for them right now. There are some people working on that. And uh, what that means is, is that if you see any filiform corrosion, you got to take care of it right now. Uh, you be very careful about pushing it in the back of your hangar because the number one way to total your V-tail is push it too far into your, uh, uh, into your uh, uh, T-hanger, crunch the rotor vaders, and then the insurance company has to total it because there are no replacement rotor vaders. So that's an issue. But flutter, flutter is, uh, is not an issue unless you got an idiot trying to repaint the rotor vaders. The rudder vaders require very narrow tolerance, and that's what the problem is. You can't get that narrow of a tolerance with aluminum, so that's why they made them out of magnesium. Uh, nobody's making those blank skins anymore, 
to convert into uh, rudder vators. That's the problem. So uh, flutter would only be a problem if you got an idiot that didn't rebalance the uh, rudder vators after they were painted. Uh, so that's the critical thing there. But uh, flutter tests were actually done and uh, the airplane was, uh, speaking off the top of my head, well over 240 knots. So you ain't gonna go that fast in an F-35. So that is not, a, that is not an issue. Most of the people who throw mud at uh, Bonanzas uh, don't really know anything about Bonanzas. So take that with a grain of salt, Greg. Buy your F-35, it's great. Uh, Joseph Pavel says, uh, Hi Scott, I'm reaching out to say thank you for your YouTube channel. I appreciate that very much. And I stumbled across it a few weeks back and enjoy your way of presenting things. If anything, you've got me considering getting a private pilot's license and my own plane to share with my young kids when they're of age. Awesome. I don't know if I'm responsible for that, but it's a dream you have. I think you need to pursue it. That is awesome. It's the best thing you can do for your kids. I'm a little biased. My dad did it with me. I did it with, uh, with my kids. And uh, uh, so try it. My aviation background is 18 years with commercial airline as an aircraft technician, mostly flight line. Flight line. I've considered a career change into the flight deck over the course of my aviation career and regret not doing back, doing so back prior to having our kids and going to single income. Uh, enough of my rambling. Well, that's it. I guess that was the question. So get your ticket, share it with your kids. It's an awesome thing to do. And if they're interested, if they get interested, in, that would be even better. Uh, Mark Smith asks, uh, Scott, I just finished viewing the video on the Boutique 902. Thank you for your perspective as this continues to assist my ongoing airman's education. Just a couple of general questions. Why does ATC assign a moniker to certain flights? If 902 is a Pilatus, why is it assigned the moniker Boutique? This is a similar question I have related to Sully's flight into the Hudson. The call sign of that flight was he says Calgon is actually cactus, uh, but uh, to these monikers, further help in identifying a specific specific flight. That's a very good question, and and the, and the answer is yes, they do. And uh, every uh, big operator of airplanes, they don't use the N numbers. They do, and this the the technical term here is called radio telephony, RT, and there's a reg on it and how it works. So uh, in the Air Force, we had call signs that were assigned and deconflicted by, uh, by region. In other words, your squadron had a set number of call, call signs. And some, call, some squadrons I flew in, they, uh, they, I, as a flight lead, I got my own call sign and I'd use that all the time. Uh, others, they would use uh, a call sign and then numbers and uh, you just luck of the draw who you were today. Uh, Speed, I was a speed once, and uh, that was pretty good. Uh, never got gunny. Gunny's my call sign. And normal, normal ops, but uh, never got gunny. Uh, but it, I was grumpy for a while. I don't think it had anything to do with my attitude. But anyway, it's called radio telephone. And uh, all the airlines do it, and some of the big uh, other big operators, uh, fleet operators, do it as well. And it's exactly that. It makes it easier to refer to them, and they know who that business is, who the company is, company traffic, etc. And they know what the flight number is, and it's much easier to track. So rarely do you hear anything about the actual end number for the flight that is, has been involved. Potique happens to be that airline. Potique, PTQ is what they call, what the short version of that. And uh, American is American. Okay, U.S. Air was Cactus. And then when they they uh, folded into American, it was American. Cactus went away. So that's how that works. And uh, let's see. Okay, I, I do get a lot of questions about CG and the Bonanza accident and the day the music died. Four guys and baggage. The Bonanza, that Bonanza did not have a large baggage compartment to live to begin with. And I do think CG was an issue, but it wasn't an issue for takeoff. Uh, and uh, and we actually have no way of determining what the load was 
everything is speculation at this point because the FAA that investigated the accident didn't determine that. And uh, I guess it wasn't really that important to, to him. But I'll tell you that if it was the CG was too far out for takeoff, the pilot would not have been able to get away from the airport. He wouldn't have been able to climb and turn towards uh, Fargo. Uh, he would have crashed right away. So that, I don't think it was that for takeoff. So if you do, great. I don't care. You know, I, I, I think what I think. Uh, but I know Bonanza's pretty well, so I know how the CG works. And uh, how the CG works, actually, uh, I do think that CG would have been an issue in this case because the CG, when you burn fuel, uh, will burn fuel and from forward, and then the CG will shift aft. What that means is, is that I think that this, uh, this airplane was doomed from the start. Either it was going to crash right away, uh, which is what happened, or it was going to crash when he was trying en route, when he was trying to sneak under that weather at night uh, and the snowing and all the rest of that stuff, or is going to crash when they tried to land in Fargo, okay? Uh, because the CG would have been very, very squirrely at that point, and uh, especially if somebody tried to move around, it would have been, it would have been disastrous. So, yeah, CG was an issue, not for takeoff. Uh, <laughs> here's a, a good one. Uh, I made the comment in that video about rule number one. And I didn't define it. So, rule number one, uh, I learned it as, uh, I learned, uh, let's see, I learned it as a fighter pilot rule, okay? There's a couple of rules. But rule number one is uh, the most important one. And uh, let, me, let me define it before I tell you what it is. Uh, rule number one speaks, at, speaks about looking to yourself for your mistakes, okay, and for the solutions to your problems. You gotta look inside first. It's you that are screwing things up most of the time. Uh, so you have to look inside. And uh, you gotta have a thick skin so you don't get upset when somebody tells you how screwed up you are. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that are happy to do that. So the interesting thing is, is that rule number one actually covers so much of life in general that it's amazing. So what is rule number one? Rule number one is pull your head out of your ass. There you go. So take it for how you like it. See if it works for you. Uh, so I, I, got, I got one really good vi uh, uh, question, a long one, before I close. I want to read you. Uh, I, I read virtually every comment on every video. I don't necessarily uh, reply to everyone. It's just I don't have time. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of comments and stuff. But the ones that, uh, that crack me up, um, I, I usually save. So uh, if we do more of these Q&As, if you like these, then I'll start uh, throwing in the ones, the comments that I like. So here's one. It's from David. I'm not going to read his last name. Um, he goes, and this is actually for the day the music, music died video. He says, uh, I still don't know what happened. I watched the video and it took forever, pretty much like my mom's conversations. <laughs> Then I fast forwarded and I could not find out what happened at the end. What happened and used less than 10 billion words. <laughs> I just had to laugh. My mom's conversations. So we fast forwarded and he didn't know what happens. He wants to know. And what I did was I replied in four words. They crashed and died. It's the truth. What can you say? Uh, let's see. All right. This is... Uh, I wrap this up. This is from Carlo. Um, he says, he titled his uh, email, Pilot Limbo. Hi, Scott. My name is Carlo, and I'm a 650-hour instrument-rated pilot with most of my time in a T-182T. I earned my ticket uh, in North Texas in 09, and then went, flew the next decade around locations spanning the southwest from Galveston to Monterey and everything in between, with a fair amount of mountain flying, in the Reno Tahoe area, Sierras, and Santa Fe. I flew actively through the summer of 2019 until a car accident and an incident that was not my fault or wrongdoing, but it landed me in surgery for a serious injury to my right leg. Staring at the prospect of having to ground myself in my airplane 
for a considerable time led me to a difficult decision of selling my aircraft and hanging up my wings. And here I edited the, because uh, there's personal stuff here, and I edited it for brevity and privacy. And uh, I get to, so as I read back through this email and attempt to find an ask, a purpose, a meaning or a motive uh, to write, I'm struggling to close my thoughts or figure out what my objective may be in writing this email to you. Maybe it's just about sharing these truths and hoping to get a different perspective on how one may try to get back in the saddle or if they should just move on to something else. Uh, sometimes there is good and goodbye. Maybe though, words spoken too soon. Any thoughts, reflections, or feedback are welcome. Keep the videos going and fly safe. So what I said was, is thanks for reaching out to me and watching my videos. I hope you find inspiration out of them and I appreciate your grasping for some direction and truth considering flying in life. You know, I don't claim to have all the answers, and I don't. Heck, I probably don't even know that many of the questions, but I do know there are no guarantees in life. That's what I found out. No safety net or insurance can protect you from life itself. Shit does happen. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. Life is life, and your life is what you make of it. Mitigating risk, I think, is the prudent approach to the way we, to the, to in any part of life, whatever walk or aspect of life you're talking about, mitigate risk. Um, as you experience with your car accident, we are one moment away from drastic and final change. Moreover, we cannot predict when it will happen and insurance is for those who leave, we leave behind. It seems to me that you are asking more about philosophy than you are about flying and risk. For me, flying and life are intertwined, and I'm being honest with you here. I could go on without flying, but my life wouldn't be as rich and enjoyable as it is with it. Not just the flying, but the people I meet and uh, and flying as well. So I'm in, and I said I'm in a different place than you are right now. My kids are all grown up, and I don't have to provide for them. I admit uh, it does change the equation a little bit. But during the time my kids were little, I was in the Air Force flying fighters and going to war. And that is inherently more dangerous than civilian flying. In civilian flying, you have a choice. Make the right choice. Don't mitigate risk. Don't do something dumb, different, or dangerous. Um, I prepared as best I could when I was in the Air Force and was consciously choosing and weighing each alternative. But I took the risk, and frankly, I wouldn't change any of that. Um, for myself, I believe that going through life scared is not an option for me. I'm talking about me, not anybody else. You can find your own version of scared. I mitigate the risks and prefer, prepare for the losses and proceed with life and flying. I think we can learn lessons from everyone in our lives, whether or not we know them personally uh, or intimately. I do my accident reviews not to highlight the fact that people died or they screwed up. I do them because I think there are lessons to be learned that can keep people alive, keep other pilots alive, and that is worthwhile. It's not meant to be a discouragement or to be a laundry list of those who pay the maximum price for their errors or just chance. Make the best decisions you can with the information you have, driven by principle and intention. I believe that. Choose a path, and I'd be willing to bet that the majority of folks out there that our statistics would choose differently if they had the awareness of the specific risk they were taking. In other words, a lot of times I don't think people consider the risk that they're taking. And uh, they truly evaluate those risks in that perspective. I no longer fly to minimums unless I'm forced to do so because I don't have to. Uh, I'm not getting paid to. I have time. So I don't, minimums are great. I do when I'm practicing, but I don't want to do it for real. Uh, I have choice, and so I choose situations where I don't get forced to do stuff like that. Uh, and I don't take off. I do take off at night, uh, in the wee hours before dawn, but I don't fly at night. In other words, I don't plan on doing the whole operation at night. I take off with uh, because dawn mostly because if I'm eastbound from here, I get through DFW when there's hardly any traffic. And uh, it's great. If not, you know, it'll add a half hour just 
if you wait to make it through all the traffic. Um, I choose not to fly at night, not just because you can't see the ground in case of engine flare, engine failure. I do it because I'm human and I get tired at night. Um, my rhythm is daytime. I get up at oh dark 30 and I go to bed early. Uh, I no longer fly airliners where I had to fly at night. Uh, but even then the safety margins are far greater than a single engine land. So I, I, I actually stopped counting friends and family lost. It's counterproductive. Honor them by learning from their mistakes. Maintain your airplane. One of the most important things be actively involved maintaining your airplane. Don't take unsupported risks. Join the 180 club and turn around. If you don't have, if you perceive a problem, it's no hit on you. It's no, well, I'm a good pilot or I'm a bad pilot. I'd rather be a cautious pilot than a live pilot than the greatest pilot we ever knew. Uh, join the 180 club, turn around, land. Flying is freedom, in my view. It also, it does demand dedication and awareness. There is so much joy in life and in flying that I hope you choose to bring flying back into your life. And I talk, for anybody watching this video, that's, I count that for you. Uh, and live the best life you can while you have it. That's, that's it. If you can't bring yourself to fly again, well, you know, that's fine. Um, it happens and that wouldn't be, I might, you might be sad about it, but uh, move on. I strongly think that you should not live your life in fear. Live it fiercely. Uh, it was one of his questions was about twins, and one thing about twins, you know, frankly, I don't spend a whole lot of time flying them anymore. Uh, you have to be committed to keeping your engine failure skills sharp and preparing for the worst. In a way, an engine failure in a twin and the takeoff regime is worse than a single. In a single, I know, <laughs> I know what I have to do. There's no options. In a twin, how close you are to disaster. Uh, can be on the fine edge. Um, so you have to be sharp and prepared for the worst. Uh, you know, having a turbine doesn't help, hurt either. Uh, but that's, you know, that's not the kind of flying that I like to do now. So I, do, I try to do the flying that interests me. Selfish? What? I don't care. <laughs> it's freedom, right? For me, flying is how I express my life, and, and I'm not ready to give that up. There used to be... Uh, a road rally in Michigan, I think it's in Michigan, on the back roads, and they call it the POR, the press on regardless. Man, for years I wanted to drive that race. That just looked like so much fun. And even though I've never done it, um, I think it has informed me on how to live my life. And I hope you can find peace and purpose. We all need that. Good luck and press on regardless. Hope you liked the video. If you got questions that you want to ask, send me an email. Uh, off the website flywire.online uh, or uh, leave a comment in a video or and in one of the videos and I'll pick it up and you might make the next one so we'll see if uh, this is a popular event thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on flywire